Now, Seneca, the book that you wrote is a, is a story of what happened, right? Mm -hmm. It's only a fraction of what actually yeah. happened. And the book is not finished yet. No. And you named it Dwelling in the Secret Place. And where did you take that from? Well, it comes from Psalms 91, verse 1. And, and let me read it to you. All right. Because I think it is very fitting. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. How can you trust in God if you do not have experiences exactly. where you learn to be dependent upon yes. Him, even to the point of death? And the secret place is there where you commune with God, that where He teaches you, that where He teaches you what His character is about. That is the secret place where only you and Him can understand. It's like that song, I come to the garden alone. Yes. Yes. And then you will... While, while the dew is still on the roses. Yes. And then it says, Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. We've had both. Yes. We've had many a fowler who tried to mm. snare us. And we've had some noisome pestilences that have plagued us. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So when things go wrong and people say it's this, that, and the other, you've done something wrong, it's your diet, it's this, that, and the other... And you end up in hospital and they say, what do you eat? Is that what made you sick? And then eventually they say, I've never seen someone recover so quickly. Whatever it is you're eating, please continue that way. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that waiteth that noonday. I think we've experienced all of that. Mm. But we haven't experienced this yet. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. That's the time in history where we are now. Yes. Very soon, God will end this calamity that is taking place on this earth. And then there will be made a difference between those that believe and those that don't. That's the promise. Mm -hmm. But before you get to that promise, you have many terrors by night, pestilences, fowlers, and the book is not finished yet. No. It's finished, but the story isn't finished. Right. Actually, the, I first titled the book Story Without End because when this time on earth is over, it will carry on and it will be endless life forever. That's true, but at the moment, but at the moment you have to dwell in the secret yes. place of the Most yes. High or else you will, not or else you will give up. Yes. Don't give up. No. Don't give up. No.
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and is teaching in our past history. This is Sam. We call him Sam because we don't know whether he's a Samantha or whether he's a Samuel. And that will be decided when he lays an egg or not. So for the moment, he's just Sam. on no matter how great opposition becomes there are always those that also recognize the positive side so it's not all negative uncle Frenchy always says two men behind the bars one saw mud and one saw stars so you can make it your life's business to look at the mud or you could make it your life's business to concentrate on the stars. Now, not everybody in this church is against what we preach. There are many people that, that have accepted the truth because of it. And there are many that have been in the church for many, many years, third, fourth, fifth generation, and they appreciate many of the things we do. And I remember one conference president saying to me, he cannot understand how I can preach like this. So he attended a whole series of mine. He says he was so nervous when I spoke the way I do that he literally held on to his chair not to run out of the <laughs> hall. He held on to his chair. And he said after a while he realized that the only one who wanted to run out of the hall was him. <laughs> remember that? Yes, I remember. He told us. Yeah. And then he said all the others were listening. And decisions were made. And people accepted the truth. And then he realized that Different people need different things and there are different methods and ways in which you can preach the gospel. My method and our method was clean out the house, clean out the garbage so that you can see the beautiful stones. Mm. Other people speak only about the beautiful stones and people come in and they see the mud and the dirt and they walk right out. Exactly. So what about doing it the other way around? Preach about the mud that has to be removed so that you can appreciate the beautiful stones. And then when you come in and you see the mud and you say, ah, I know there's mud, 
but they are beautiful stones here. Take the Lord at his word, study the promises, and appropriate them as you have need. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Happy is the man who, when tempted, finds his soul rich in the knowledge of the scriptures, who finds shelter beneath the promises of God. That conference president later became a union president and then he decided that it was time that I should be ordained as a pastor. And at a huge camp meeting with many speakers from overseas, some of whom are dead now already, one of them was uh, Richard O'Fill, oh, remember yes, him? Yes, yes. They were all there when I was ordained as a pastor. Now, the ordination in itself is like a, a stamp of approval of the church. So it's something to cherish. Mm -hmm. But it's also a passport to be able to preach. Life exploded. It stood fast. Nothing exploded and created everything. It is because I so greatly desire to work for the salvation of souls that I do not give up to infirmities. I am determined that as long as God permits me to live, I will proclaim the message of warning to the world. I want my voice to reach many more before I shall give up my labors. But not all countries are as happy to accept <laughs> this kind of preaching. And some, particularly uh, in Europe, were very anti and would not appreciate the fact that I actually was ordained. But that doesn't make the ordination undone. And no matter what the trials are, no matter what the tribulations are, I have learned over the years that the greater the opposition to the truth, the more prominent the truth becomes. Yeah. So if you go to Europe, for example, and a church leader makes a huge noise and warns everybody never to attend that man's lectures, it's the best advertisement that could be made, mm -hmm. and then the halls are full. Yeah. Remember that? Yes, I remember. That How many time. times that happened? Yes. But the, coming, coming back to the president who ordained you, at that camp meeting, he, he appreciated evangelism. And at that camp meeting, he said, people, 
we are going to take up money. When we take up the, uh, the offering today, it's going to go to evangelism. And, and they were all against him and said, no, it has to go to... They were in debt. To cover the debt of yes. the church. They were in debt. And then he said, no, we are going to use it for evangelism. And can you remember what happened then? They said, all right, let's take up a second offering yes. then. So they took up the biggest offering they had ever, ever taken up, and it went all to evangelism. evangelism. And he said, let's take up a second offering. And through that offering, the entire church came out of debt. Yes. So God is amazing. He wants you to, to think about his message first, and all these things will, will be, be added, added unto you. Yes. So when in Europe they preach against the truth and they try to prevent you from preaching, it does nothing other than advertising. Mm -hmm. And when they accused me before the courts of Germany and eventually that investigation took one year to complete and you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. They told you that you must be ready to, to go fly there and to be in court. Yes, and then maybe be imprisoned. Yes. And the government f exonerated me completely. And then you would expect the church to say, well, sorry, we made a mistake. Mm. But to this day, that has not been forthcoming. But it doesn't matter. No. Uh, the people know what the truth is. And God knows. And God knows what the truth is. And the truth will triumph no matter what they do. And uh, they ban me. They ban me from the churches. I may not preach in the churches. Well, then I'll preach in a hall. Because they have to ask themselves the question, in the time of the disciples, did they tell them that they were no longer to preach in this name? All the time. And what did they say? They went and preached in his name. And they said, we have to obey God more, more than, than man. man. So if I am convinced in my mind and in my heart that the Lord has placed this burden of this message onto my heart, if I don't preach it, then I'm working against my conscience. So they can shout as much as they like. Now, if their shouting convinced me that there were no fruits, then I would stop. But if their shouting just proves to me that more and more people embrace the truth, mm. then no matter how much they shout, I will ignore them until God tells me to stop preaching this message. There are many people that write to us and say they were... Catholic, they were atheists, they were evolutionists, they were, they were occultists. Yes. And they've come out and they have embraced the truth. Yes, we've got one after the other. People that have come out of secret societies, people that have come out of secret military organizations. We have, there are so many people. And the interesting thing to me is that it covers the entire spectrum from the poorest of the poor to the most famous of the most famous, from film stars to people with very little education. And it covers the entire spectrum. Mm. And you say to yourself, should they not have the opportunity to hear this truth? Of course. One leader told me, very prominent leader, he said to me, you will not preach these things. You will stop immediately. And he commanded me to stop. And I walked out of there and I said, Lord, what do I do with this? And as I walked out, a young man came and hugged me and said, I was a new ager. Thank you for preaching the truth. And I walked into a hall and Uncle Frenchy was with me and the man came up to me and said, thank you for preaching the truth. I have accepted it. And he was a neurosurgeon. <laughs> and then a third one came and he was an evolutionary geologist and he had accepted the truth. And I said to him, should they not believe these things? Mm. So I could safely ignore 
or what that person had said. Why do they say these things? Because they love, like our cat, to bask in the sunshine of acceptance with the other churches. They are, and uh, you they can't are listen to that. They are scared, maybe even scared of consequences that for persecution. I think the Spirit of Prophecy says very clearly that when persecution comes, those people will, will not have been fortified through the trials for standing for the truth. Yes, in this world you will have tribulation. I expect to have trials, but I do not dread them. The Lord knows what I can bear. He will give me strength to endure. He will sustain me in my weakness, enabling me to follow on and to know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. As the sun sets behind me, I cannot help but wonder whether the sand of time for this world is running out. We have been traveling through the whole of Europe on the footsteps of the Reformation. What is it that drives us? We believe that God's people in the end of time must be restorers of the breach, restorers of paths to dwell in. We believe that the commandments of God that have been downtrodden must be restored. We believe that the world needs to hear a message, the three angels' message as recorded in the chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. And we have been in some remarkable situations. God has opened doors for us. It was incredible. We got into places and stood in places where we never thought we would be able to stand. As the sun sets, I believe the sunset of this world is very, very near. And we have to make an individual choice. We cannot hide behind the ecclesiastical powers. We cannot hide behind the authorities of the world. We have to base our decisions on the Word of God. And therefore today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. What happened to you with your hip? Oh, <laughs> that was a, quite a story. 
We had our daughter Tanya for the weekend. She was working, she was a rep, rep for a medical firm and she was vis visiting us for the weekend and we watched Bunyan's um, Pilgrim's Progress and she, it, something happened to her and she said, wow, I understand now how, what the Christian Why walk is. Why it is such a tough walk. Yes. And then she, um, that morning early, six o'clock the morning, she left and you were out fixing a pipe on, uh, on the farm. And she, I realized we hadn't prayed with her because she's now, you know, at the stage where, where she's realizing what is truth, but she's still not firm in the truth. And I ran out to go and tell her, don't, don't leave before we've prayed. And I've forgotten that as I came around the corner, I had stacked some, some wood and I tripped, but it wasn't just a trip and fall. It was a trip which flung me right into the air. It felt like it was a wind that lifted me and I came crashing onto the paving and it was rough bricks because I could, I could actually hear this, this part tear. I could hear it because it was next to my ear. You still could see the scar there. Yes, yeah. I could hear the flesh tear. And it was t a big, big, big wound. And I couldn't get up and then I was screaming and then you came. I just uh, happened to arrive, arrive at that yes. moment. And you helped me up and got me to the hospital. It was like 50 kilometers that we had to drive and with, uh, yeah, in pain. And at the hospital, they said, yes, it, my hip was broken. And they had to and send you to another hospital. Yes. And then they refused to use the ambulance. Yes. There were four ambulances standing there. I think it was four. It was a government hospital. Four ambulances, and they refused to send you with an ambulance mm -hmm. because you had a medical aid. Yes. If you didn't have a medical aid, they would send you with an ambulance. Yes. And I said, I would pay for the ambulance. But that woman was so stubborn, she refused that the doctor was so angry with her and the doctor scolded her, but she just stood there and said, no ambulance. So then, he helped me and we pulled you into the car, onto the back seat via the sheet. We pulled you off mm -hmm. the bed, the trolley, and pulled you into the car. And I had to drive those rough roads it's with another you. Another 100 kilometers. 100 kilometers to the next hospital. Yes. Where they operated you. Mm. And then they discovered that your entire hip was shattered. Mm. They needed to get bone. And they didn't have any. They didn't have artificial bone. So they found another hospital which was 80 kilometers away and they had bone. And they put the bone into a car and drove it to this hospital. But halfway there was a police stop that caused the traffic jam for kilometers. And so eight hours you were on the operating table. Mm -hmm. Waiting for the Waiting bone. for bone. And then the surgeon came out to me and he said, where were you when this accident took place? And I said, I was out in the field fixing pipes. He said, do you have any witnesses for that? <laughs> and I thought to myself, what is this man getting at? I said, why? Is there something wrong? He says, this is no normal accident. This looks like a head-on collision, as if somebody took a big pole and smashed a hip. I want to know where you were and whether you have witnesses. I thought to myself, wow, this man thinks I did it. <laughs> but fortunately, the laborer was there, remember? Yes, and Tanya was there. And my daughter was there. And so, yeah, yeah it was a terrible accident. Well, it was such a bad break because the pelvis was broken, the socket was broken, the femur was broken. Um, there was, it was such a bad accident that they said I wasn't allowed to even touch the ground with my foot and stand on it for six months. And, so it, and now they had artificial bone and now m my flesh... Bone had to grow into it that It had bone. to grow, grow into that bone. 
and it just wasn't growing because there was nothing to hold it. There's so many screws and so many things and, and nothing was there. It was a big empty thing. And so the doctor said, well, if it doesn't grow on, it will have to be amputated. The whole leg. The whole leg. From the hip. Yeah. And we said, all right, we will ask the Lord to, um, to help us because we, we can't do anything anymore. The doctors can't do anything. And we had, a, with Uncle Frenchy, we had a, a trip planned to, to Jerusalem, I think the Middle East, and then we were supposed to go to Loma Linda. So it was all planned. And here I am on crutches. And I said, no, I'll go. I'm going to go. You were stubborn. Why I are you so stubborn? stubborn? Yes. I you had stubborn. to learn to become stubborn. Yes. I think the Lord, through that experience, he, he wanted me to go through that experience, to, to have faith that he is going to do something. So just before we left, we had camp meeting, and you asked the pastors to anoint me. And my friend came and she treated, she um, uh, detoxed me because I'd been on lots of medication. So she detoxed me. But that's a process. It's amazing. God first clean, cleans your mind, detoxes you. Then he anoints you, and then he gives you the solution. So the solution came in Loma Linda when we, uh, you were lecturing, and, and this lady came to me and she said, I noticed that, well, she didn't say I noticed, she said, I'm aware of it that, that you maybe need help. We didn't tell anybody. But you were on crutches. I was on crutches, but, you know, she didn't know that I... I wasn't, he, wasn't healing, you know, I was suffering, I was in pain. And she said, I just want to tell you my husband is a, what's he? Um, orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeon, but a special, he's specialized in a special way of treating it. And um, so I said, no, no, I'm fine. But then as she walked away, I thought, you know, maybe the Lord has sent her to me. And I called her back and I said, yes, I'm actually in pain. Maybe your husband can look at me. And um, so the next day he came with a little suitcase and he came and he checked through, he checked my hip and he said, well, you have inflammation in the bursa, in the little sac. And it's not healing. And it's not healing. And he said he is one of the, I think maybe two people that, that have been trained to, to actually treat or actually discovered the method to treat such a situation. To treat it. Only one of two in the entire world. Yes, something like something that. Something like that. Yes. And then he Or the only one, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. And he then um, injected me right into the bursa, into the right in a very plate. special technique. Special technique. And from there on I got better and when I came back home I was able to put the crutches away and I was still limping. I was struggling to walk for two years before I could walk normal, normally. So the Lord used my friend to detox me. The Lord anointed me through his pastors and then they gave me the treatment that cleared up the inflammation. But you had to say, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Whether I'm sick or not, yes. the Lord will take care yes. of it. Yes. So people think that when you are working in the Lord's vineyard, then life will be smooth sailing and trouble no, free. Satan will never stop having And how many people said it's your diet that you broke your hip? Many people. Many people. In fact, one pastor said to me, he was a health reforming pastor, and he said to me, oh, it's such a pity that you broke your hip because now you're not a good example for the health reform anymore. And that, that really hurt me because I've been living as healthily as I possibly could. And then the, the hospital did tests on your bone and said they were the most perfect, perfect they had seen perfect. for a woman your yeah. age. Mm. So it's always encouraging when these things happen.
through my long affliction, I have been most signally blessed of God. In the most severe conflicts, with intense pain, I realized the assurance, my grace is sufficient for you. At times when it seemed that I could not endure the pain, when unable to sleep, I looked to Jesus by faith, and his presence was with me. Every shade of darkness rolled away. Your wishes, your will, will be often crossed, but you should not be discouraged. Jesus loves you and he wants you to be happy, even in this life, and to be a light in the world. I wish you could see, and our people could see, what they may be and what they may become. God will work with your efforts. Tests will come to us daily in trials and disappointments, and the true character is developed. And it doesn't mean that the trials and the tribulations will stop. And sometimes you need wake-up calls. Mm -hmm. And uh, through circumstances, and especially when COVID came along and traveling was impossible, through many, many circumstances that I don't think I need to talk about at the moment, we were compelled to start our own ministry, which is Clash of Minds. And we started the WhatsApp program. And we started so small, and God has helped us to build up a, a presence in the world, especially through the WhatsApp prof. And now we have a, a health ministry, and we're going to start a school. And when we got all of these things going, you got sick. Yes. And you got terribly, terribly sick from all of the repercussions of all of those horrendous things that went wrong with you and all the things that had grown together oh, in your sure. intestines. And mm -hmm. this was a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to rush you back into the hospital and they had to do an emergency operation on you and you... You just shrunk away to nothing. How many kilos did you lose? Oh, 15, 15 kilos. You lost 15 mm -hmm. kilos. And I looked at you and I thought to myself, is this where it's going to end? Our little <laughs> sojourn together is going to end. And we were prepared that this time round you would not recover. Mm -hmm. But here you are, <laughs> still praise, going. Praise God. It's and exactly one year later. Exactly. August to August. August to August. So this August, I got sick. Mm. Out of the blue. And it got so bad that uh, I also thought I wasn't going to make it. I thought I was going to bury you. You were ready to bury me? Mm -hmm. And then you rushed me through to that hospital after that doctor said, you better go immediately. And I said to you on the way, it's a, what's 120 kilometers away. I said to you, I don't think we're going to get there. Or I'm not going to get there. But I got there. Yes, and here you are. Here I am, and they did an emergency procedure on me and... And then I got a terrible infection. And it was one of those antibiotic-resistant infections. And it was touch and go whether I would live or whether I would not live. We tried everything natural and everything under the sun and nothing worked. And then I got to the point where I said, OK, God, there's nothing I can do anymore. I also lost 15 kilograms. Mm -hmm. And if there's nothing I can do, then the only one that can help now is you. And I 
totally surrender the situation to you. And again, I ended up in hospital. And I lay there and they had to again do a procedure. And I, I spoke to God and I said to him, I'm happy to die because I've had a very full life, a very interesting life, probably more interesting than most people have. I've had many ups and I've had many downs and uh, I'm still here and I'm grateful for that. But then I said to him, Lord, the three angels' messages, they need to be preached. And the loud cry needs to be preached. And I know my usefulness might be at an end. I mean, I am old already. And if it is your will that this comes to an end here, then I will accept that. But I would really like to be part of the final message to humanity. Eight many years, I've been engaged in active labor, speaking to the people and writing out the instruction opened before me. At times, sickness has come upon me, and then I would cast my helpless soul upon Jesus Christ and say, Thou knowest, Lord, that I have chosen Thee as my Redeemer. Give me not only spiritual strength, but physical strength, that I may follow on to know Thee. And the Lord has never forsaken me. Always has he been my helper, as he will be yours if you will trust him. seek your way clear to make that possible then I surrender it to you and from that time on I was placed in three different wards and in the one ward there were nurses and people working and I asked that my diet be in harmony with the diet that Daniel had <laughs> and they were so interested and they said why do you do this I was sick as a dog I had fevers I was shaking from this infection and they couldn't bring it under control and normally eventually those infections they kill you and uh, I had the opportunity to speak to a number of the staff members and even though I was so sick Many of them said, no, they understand. They want to change their lifestyles. Mm. And then I went from there to the operating theater, and from there I went to the ICU. Okay. And I was supposed to be in the ICU only for one day, but I ended up there for three days because they couldn't quite agree how to, to handle my situation. And in the end, a third uh, specialist came round and he looked at me and this is the third day now and he looked at me and he said aren't you Walter Fight?" because he looked at my my name of course he said aren't you the, f the famous Walter Fight?" and I said no I'm not famous I'm infamous I was attached to all of these tubes and the siren was going off because 
my oxygen levels weren't right because I was in a lot of pain and a lot of situations. And he said to me, many, many years ago, I, I saw a DVD of yours. It was about 10 years ago. I said, okay. And he said, it was interesting. And I got it from an old school friend of mine who I've been friends with for many years. And he was an Adventist. And I have a lot of respect for him and I love him because he's my friend, but I don't really understand why he has this strange religion. And he gave me this DVD and I looked at this DVD and, and uh, it was interesting, but I really don't understand what you people are all about. And then he said, perhaps you can explain to me why you believe what you believe. And there I was lying, attached to all of these tubes, looking at this man, and I said, Lord, in my head now, is this why I'm lying here? Mm -hmm. So give me the strength to tell him why I do what I do. And I gave him a talk for about an hour and a half. And he looked at me and he said, now I understand. I'm going to contact that friend of mine and I'm going to study with him because I think this is the truth. And he was panicking because he had rounds to do, but he stayed for one and a half hours with me. <laughs> and then off he went. And I realized that maybe God wasn't finished with me. Hey? Absolutely. And you were there taking care of me and bringing me some food when the hospital food was virtually unbearable because they just don't know how to prepare plant-based food. They think you take everything away that they give, and then what's left over is what you can get. <laughs> yes, and if you want a vegetable, they bring you fish or chicken. Yes. <laughs> That's a vegetable. And then I was transferred to the other hall, having come out of the ICU, just having a one-and-a-half-hour evangelistic campaign with this third individual and I lay in this in this ward and I was alone in the ward and I thought that's nice I'm alone in the ward and the next minute the first patient came in and then the second patient came in they were going for operations they were being prepared for operations one bed was still open and then the next man came in he had been in a private ward because he was very shy of people. He didn't really want to be with people, but the private wards are very expensive. And so he condescended to live with the rest of humanity, <laughs> came into this ward. And he started talking to me. I was opposite him. I was still attached to a number of tubes and things. And then he started talking about religion. It's interesting, if you are in a hospital, people talk about religion, yes. right? And then he started off with uh, noticing that I was eating differently to the rest. And he said, why do you eat differently? And I explained to him, as well as I could under the circumstances, why I eat differently. And he said, you know, all my life I know there's something wrong with the way that we eat. So please explain it to me in, in some detail. So I explained it to him. He called the nurse. He says, excuse me, nurse, I want to change my menu that I ordered for my, for my supper. From now on, I will eat what that man eats. <laughs> and I was stunned. And I said, wow, that's interesting. And he'd ordered a coffee. And he had a jar of milk next to him. And he was pouring the, the milk into the coffee. And before he put it to his lips, he said to me, is there anything wrong with coffee? That's the worst thing you can ask me under those circumstances. So I gave him another lecture about coffee and dairy. He took the cup from his lips, put it down, called the nurse, 
and said, nurse, please take it away and bring me the herb tea that that man is drinking. I'm done with that forever. And from that health, we went to religion. And he wanted to know everything. So I went through Daniel. I went through Daniel 2. I went through Daniel 7. I went through the Reformation. I went through Revelation. I told him everything about Protestantism versus Catholicism. And that's why you were both still in pain. Yes, I was in pain while I was lecturing to him and I hardly had a voice and I, I tried to take a few breaths and I drank some water and I carried on. But I, I hadn't explained the Sabbath to him at all. And then you came to visit and two other people came to visit as well. And they started talking to him and he was so excited. Remember mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And then you piped up and you said what? can't remember exactly, but you I said something. told about the, the school and your son. Oh, yes, I told him son. about our oldest son who went to the 12th grade farewell. Um, and it was supposed to be on a Friday evening. And the whole school changed it to a Wednesday evening. Because he be was a Sabbath Because keeper, he kept the Sabbath. Sabbath. And I just told him that, that we were so grateful that the school did that. And I thought to myself, oh, oh. now, well, how's he going to take that? Because I hadn't explained the Sabbath to him that. at all yet. And he sat up and he said, Sabbath? What about the Sabbath? What is that about the Sabbath? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And then the visiting hour was over because mm -hmm. they're very strict in that hospital and you all left. And then I had to give him a lecture on the Sabbath, <laughs> which I did. And then he said, that's wonderful. I'm going to go home and I'm going to study my Bible and I'm going to change my diet. I will never, ever eat this, that, that and the other anymore. And I won't drink anything that is bad for my mind. And I'm going to study this issue. And when I came out of hospital, I was regenerated. Yes. And I thought to myself, you know, I had time to reflect. What is it like to go 
through the valley of death. You'd just been through it and came out alive. And I, I'd gone through it and came out alive. And I was very, very weak. I mean, I couldn't walk 10 yards without sweating like crazy. And it makes you appreciate life again. Yes. That God gives us time still to do his work and finish the work. And I realized that God wasn't finished yet. And when I said, Lord, I'm ready to go, he gave me three campaigns to do in, in a hospital. <laughs> and those people would probably have never heard that if I hadn't been there. So it encouraged me that God is not finished with us yet and that uh, we can still be a thorn in some people's flesh and they can moan and scream as much as they like. I have learned that I can trust my God and that this is the truth, the way and the life and that there is a final message to be given to the world and he wants that message to go to the world. Mm -hmm. And he raised you up again and he raised me up again and we can continue where we left off and by God's grace, we can do it until he comes. By God's grace, yes. We will see him coming. So let's encourage the people and say, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Just carry on, no matter what the devil throws at you. This is the truth. And the truth is worth it. Heaven will be cheap, cheap enough. enough. We tried to call up our greatest trials, but they looked so small compared with the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that surrounded us, that we could not speak them out, and we all cried out, Hallelujah! Heaven is cheap enough! And we touched our golden harps and made heaven's arches ring. And as for the church, this is the church militant. It's not yet the church triumphant. There will come a terrible shaking. And this church will be shaken. But those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus, according to the book of Revelation, will stand firm. They will not accept the mark of the beast. They will not follow the image of the beast. And they will go through to the kingdom. And God will put the loud cry into their mouth. And many, many people that are trapped in Babylon will come out. Never, ever give up. Amen. Amen. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Lord most high, shadow of His grace, He will safely abide. He is my peace, He is my calm in the storm, my refuge and my trust. I will not fear the darkest night, for His word my
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 